10 million dead soldiers, 21 million wounded, and 700,000 missing. A hundred years ago, World War I decimated Europe and left deep scars in its geography. Each year in France, archaeologists exploring the battlefields dig up weapons, personal belongings, and the broken bodies of soldiers who fought and died in the war. Frenchmen, Britons and Germans, but also Americans, who came over to fight side by side with the Allies. These relics bring a little-known chapter of history to light. Why did these soldiers cross the Atlantic? What did they come to fight for here in old Europe, so far away from home? And how did America shape its own future by plunging into this war? Nineteen seventeen. For the past three years, the French and English troops have been bogged down in their trenches, buried by a hail of shells, exhausted by the noise and racked by hunger. As the months went by, their situation declined. The war seemed endless. The Allied troops' morale was at its lowest ebb. Then in April, a piece of news spread hope through the trenches. News that would change the course of history. America was joining the war. Across the ocean, thousands of young Americans flocked to train stations and passenger ports. Little knowing what lay ahead, they larked around with their fellow passengers, soon to be brothers in arms. They thought naively that it would be a short but grand adventure. They would soon find out what war was really like. In the past 20 odd years in France, as the land is put to different use, archaeologists have been unearthing the war's forgotten relics. Contemporary archaeology is an up-and-coming science that revives the work of historians and builds links with a recent past that is fading from living memory. A temporary German cemetery discovered in Bult sur Suip bears witness to the violence of the first few months of the war. For certains, on retrouve des balles dans les volumes thoraciques des chairs. On retrouve beaucoup d'éclats d'obus. Certains ont commencé à être soignés, donc ils ont encore les attelles. Mais on voit que toute une jambe ou une partie du corps est encore criblée d'impact d'obus ou de billes de shrapnel. Par contre, ils sont décédés avant de pouvoir être soignés ou amputés. C'est une guerre industrielle avec un massacre de masse. Une efficacité des armes de destruction, on le voit sur les squelettes. Hein. Un petit éclat d'obus aussi gros qu'un qu un, un ongle laboure le corps et engendre le, entraîne le décès quasi immédiatement, ou en tout cas dans peu de temps après. Donc on a vraiment... On, là, on, on perçoit la fragilité du corps et la fragilité des individus. Ils sont balancés dans une fournaise que eux mêmes n'appréhendent pas ou ne pouvaient pas estimer. Donc effectivement, la mort est violente. Three years into the war, millions already lay dead. Why on earth did Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, pitch American men into this furnace? As a staunch pacifist, he was appalled by the Europeans' attitudes and had campaigned on a platform of keeping the US out of the war. American public opinion was behind him.
For now, America's president and people were watching the war from a distance. Only a handful of US reporters had been sent to Europe. Like this man, 25-year-old Cyrus Leroy Baldridge. Since August 1914, Cyrus had been traveling through German-occupied Belgium and France as a war reporter and artist. But despite his articles and illustrations, the Americans back home were deaf to the tragedy unfolding in Europe. But then a sequence of events turned public opinion against Germany. On May the 7th, 1915, the ocean liner Lusitania, bound from New York to Britain, with more than 1,200 civilians on board, including 139 Americans, was torpedoed by a German submarine. A year later, a spectacular explosion ripped through Black Tom Island, blowing rivets out of the Statue of Liberty. The investigation revealed it had been a terror attack by German agents. Six months later, Germany resumed its unrestricted submarine warfare and sent a coded message that the Americans intercepted, asking Mexico to invade Texas and Arizona. Public opinion was now well and truly in the Allies' favor. The German Empire had sealed its own fate. On April the 2nd, 1917, President Wilson stood before Congress. The French ambassador who was present described his historic address. When he declared in his speech that Germany's deeds were acts of war, applause rang out at nearly every sentence, especially when he said he wished to end the war and break the tyranny of Germany's leaders. So America went to war with an enthusiasm that probably disguised a lack of caution. The US Army was small, only 120,000 men, with no experience of conflicts on this scale and inadequately armed. And this army had no leader. Who would rise to the occasion? The man that President Wilson chose to command the American Expeditionary Force was an officer with a distinguished record. Recently, he had successfully led a punitive expedition against the famous Mexican outlaw and revolutionary Pancho Villa, who had been making violent raids on American soil. But how could leading a few thousand men into battle compare with what lay ahead in Europe? the American soldiers would not be up against an irregular gang of bandits. The enemy ahead was perfectly equipped and hardened by three years of combat experience. And that wasn't Pershing's only problem. In spite of Wilson's speech, the mood in America had swung around not many US citizens, even the most anti-German ones, volunteered to go to war. Recruitment drives took to the streets with posters and ever more lurid slogans. The Germans are murderers and the French people are heroes. The walls of America's cities were plastered with anti-German sentiments. But for all the vim and vigor of the speechwriters and the venom of the media campaign, 
not many Americans step forward to enlist. Wilson responded by instituting the draft. Hundreds of thousands of men all over the country were picked by lot and told to sign up to fight in Europe. In a few short weeks, these young men, the sons or brothers or grandsons of others who stayed behind, were turned into the soldiers that Uncle Sam needed. And so they were named by the French as Sammies. Most of them had never set foot outside the United States. On May the 10th, 1917, the first of them embarked from the East Coast on a two-week voyage to ports in France and England. It was their turn to be engulfed by the Great War. The French discovered and welcomed with open arms these handsome young American soldiers who had come to fight by their side. General Pershing described his arrival in Paris. Cheers and tears were mingled together. Women climbed into our automobiles screaming Vive l'Amérique, entirely beyond the control of the police. A poem to this bond of friendship was an immediate hit. We salute you, soldiers from the New World, who have sailed the ocean blue and come here, where the cannons roar, to lend the fertile land of France your strong and generous support. Would the Samis help the Allies turn the tide and win the war? Nobody seemed worried, except the American general in command. How would they all be transported up to the front? How would they be trained and armed and their needs be met? The American soldiers were raring to go, but they weren't combat ready yet. They'd been through some basic training back home, but these young recruits had rarely drilled with real equipment. They often had to make do with rifles and cannons made of wood. To complete their training, Pershing had training camps built in France, a few dozen kilometers back from the front lines. Now at last, the Samis could drill with the guns they would actually use in battle and be trained by experienced French and British instructors. But for now, the war still had the taste of adventure. I never spent such a fascinating and interesting evening. There was a sergeant from one of the Scotch regiments, two other English sergeants, this sergeant major, and also a French sergeant who speaks very good English. Well, I just wish you could have heard them. They'd all been in the trenches from two to two and a half years. Looking at them now, who could imagine the maze of trenches and shell holes that riddled these fields? when they were battlegrounds. Here at Massige, archeologists and volunteers have spent 20 years piecing together the networks of trenches in which the first battalions of Samis finished their training. It was the fresh young soldiers' first taste of the cold, wet, cramped conditions they would live in.
l'Amérique, en quelques mois, va devoir passer d'une petite armée à une armée de, de conscription euh, qui comporte plusieurs millions d'hommes. Il faut leur apprendre à euh, comment se battre dans un contexte très particulier qui est la, la guerre de tranchées dans un premier temps sur le, le front occidental. Tout ça suppose une logistique monstrueuse à laquelle finalement les Américains sont certainement le peuple le plus apte à y répondre puisqu'ils ont une industrie qui derrière va fournir la possibilité, vous vous rendez compte, de faire cantonner 2 millions de soldats. Il y a par exemple le département de la Haute-Marne euh, où il y a à peine 250 000 habitants, va accueillir jusqu'à 400 ou 500 000 Américains. Donc vous avez plus d'Américains en Haute-Marne en 1917 que de population civile. War reporter and artist Cyrus Leroy Baldridge went with the Samis as they were deployed to the trenches. He started a series of drawings which he later titled I Was There, that captured better than any photograph the soldiers gearing up or in their private moments. In December 1917, they still had smiles on their faces. But on the front line, the threat from Germany was growing every day. The Bolshevik regime in Russia had just signed a peace deal with Germany, releasing millions of German troops to be shipped from the Eastern Front to swell the ranks of the Kaiser's army in France. The nervous allies asked Pershing to beef up their own forces with Uncle Sam's draftees. But Pershing would allow no mixing. President Wilson's orders were formal. The Samis would fight under the American flag and no other. And General Pershing faced another problem. The Americans' gigantic logistics machine was delaying the Samis from going to war. Back home, the factories were producing at full strength as civilians pitched in for the war effort by churning out vast quantities of steel, copper and brass, and building locomotives, road vehicles, and weapons of every kind. These thousands of tons of material and supplies were shipped to France and dispatched among the training camps or close to the front line. Meanwhile, troops went on disembarking in their thousands. December 26th, 1917. On the landing wharves, a sudden silence gripped the crowds of civilians and dock workers. What dumbfounded them was not yet another troop ship arriving full of soldiers, but the music coming from its decks. It was a kind of music the French had never heard before, but instantly adored. Ragtime, the ancestor of jazz. The future 369th Infantry Regiment was partly made up of the Clef Club, 99 African-American musicians from New York City's most famous jazz club. But the good times between this all-black American regiment and the French population were short-lived. As soon as they hit the shore, the African-American troops were set aside and confined to jobs such as stretcher bearing or carrying supplies. The French High Command could not understand why these soldiers were being sidelined when the need for combat troops was so urgent. Pershing came up with a way to satisfy the Allies. His army wanted to segregate its troops. So why not let the French have the black regiments? the African-American soldiers felt they had been abandoned. Our great American general simply put the black orphan in a basket, set it on the doorstep of the French, pulled the bell, and went away. The four all-black American regiments were sent to fight alongside the French infantry, in French uniform 
and under the French tricolor flag. March 1918. While the African-American troops joined the French fighters at the front, the other Samis in the rear seemed to carry on training forever. When they first arrived, the locals had welcomed them with open arms. Some had even found romance. But now they were bored and restless. When would they get to fight? To take advantage of the Americans' delay, on March the 21st, the Germans launched a surprise attack that they hoped would be decisive. From east of Arras to the south of Saint-Quentin, the front went up in flames. Five hundred and fifty thousand German soldiers were sent into battle and hurled themselves at the enemy trenches. One eyewitness said, In only six days, the Allies have lost all their hard-won ground. Their sacrifices of the past three years are now in vain. A wind of panic blew through the Allied troops. Although his men were still untested, General Pershing finally made a tough decision and agreed to combine them with the Allied forces. At this moment, there are no other questions but of fighting. Infantry, artillery, all that we have are yours. I have come to tell you that the American people will be proud to take part in the greatest battle of history. April the 20th, 1918. At long last, the Allied High Command sent the Samis into action. Their task was to hold the village of Sechepre in Lorraine. It was in a quiet sector, far away from the battles ranging in Flanders. But suddenly, the big guns roared, and the Germans launched a surprise attack to test the mettle of the American soldiers. By the time the Samis counterattacked, it was too late. The Germans had withdrawn, leaving 160 Americans dead and 650 wounded, and taken 100 prisoners. Pershing had hoped for a glorious first battle but instead it was a failure. In his first battle alongside the Samis, Cyrus Leroy Baldridge was struck by the viciousness of the fighting. If only I could make the public see what war is, what a dirty, low thing it is, and how brutal. In the Stars and Stripes, the journal that published Baldrige's drawings, American readers discovered the reality they had chosen to ignore. The war against Germany would be long, gruesome, and expensive. President Wilson had done the math. America's commitment to the war could cost the country over $30 billion the equivalent of $550 billion today. A new publicity campaign appealed to the nation to support the war effort. The government urged all its citizens to buy government bonds known as Liberty Bonds. Over time, these war bonds financed up to 60% of the military budget. They were also a windfall for the Allied countries, to whom the USA lent almost $10 billion. Wilson considered it not a bad deal for America. When the war is over, the Allies will be financially in our hands. 
But in May 1918, his prediction depended on the Samis gaining victory on the ground. Since their failure at Seshapre, the American soldiers had been thirsting to get even. Their chance came a month later, at Contigny, in the Somme. The Samis were ordered to take a village. It was not an easy task. The French had already tried twice and failed. The fighting was more ferocious than ever, as the Germans refused to give in to these inexperienced young soldiers. But the Americans held firm, and their tenacity won through. On May the 31st, the exhausted Germans stopped fighting. Pershing was happy. With this victory, now he could face down the European chiefs of staff, who had not believed that the US Army could hold its own. It was a matter of pride to the whole American expeditionary force that the troops of this division, in their first battle, displayed the fortitude and courage of veterans, held their gains, and denied to the enemy the slightest advantage. From now on, on the front line and in the rear, the Samis were brothers in arms with the Allied soldiers and shared their traumatic experiences. Now they knew what the soldiers of the Great War had been going through for the past three years. When we left the transport back in Saint-Nazaire, you asked us, quand fini la guerre? Then up in the trenches, it was just the same. When's it going to finish? Didn't seem quite game. Then we saw you strafing, saw we had you wrong. Wondered how you stood it four years long. How the hell did you do it? Although Pershing was pleased, the Samis' first victory at Contigny was a sideshow. The Germans had crested the ridge of Chemin des Dames. Once again, Paris was in danger. Time was of the essence. The Allied Chief of Staff, General Ferdinand Foch, and British General-in-Chief Douglas Haig appealed for urgent reinforcements from America to stave off defeat. President Wilson responded at once. In July, a record 300,000 American troops were shipped over the ocean. Now, there were a million Samis on French soil. The Germans tried to ramp up the fighting before the Americans could properly join the fray. Their plan was simple, take Paris and force a surrender. The Allies needed to block the Germans' way to Paris. In the battle that followed, the Samis were given a section of front line to hold for the very first time. For a month at Bois Bello, near Chateau Thierry, the Marines fought with a ferocity that took even their enemy by surprise. The Samis held the line, but with very heavy losses. We ain't saying nothing, and my brains are numb and dopey, trying to cuss and trying to pray. I just lift one foot and shove it, and it hits most any place. Then I lift and shove the other to keep from falling on my face. The Samis were exhausted. Their recent battles had left them with 10,000 dead and many more wounded. But here again, the US Army had planned ahead. The vast logistics operation that had so delayed the Samis' entry into war now proved its worth. The American Ambulance Medical Corps medics immediately took care of the wounded and sent them by train to the many hospital camps standing ready in the rear.
The camp at Mars sur Allier in the Nièvre department was one of the larger ones. It had been built to accommodate 20,000 wounded in nearly 700 bunkhouses, with 20,000 more beds in tents ready for exceptional emergencies. The American doctors had state-of-the-art equipment to hand. Operating theaters, X-ray facilities, chemical and germ warfare laboratories. The high command had even had a railroad built and a fully independent water supply with its own pipes that had been shipped like everything else from the United States. A farmer turned up the remnants of a camp while plowing his fields. Alors, ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est quand les Américains sont arrivés en France, ils ont construit ces euh, villes champignons, ces villes géantes qu'on peut comparer à, aux villes du Far West, qui ont poussé au milieu de nulle part, hein, dans des campagnes euh, comme ici dans la Nièvre où il n'y avait ni l'eau courante ni l'électricité. Eux ont amené ces, on va dire, ces technologies-là, ces innovations-là. On peut comparer ça et son organisation à un camp de l'armée romaine euh, sans aucun problème. L'organisation militaire, euh, l'acheminement des blessés, euh, l'acheminement euh, des vivres, euh, etc. Quand on découvre ces objets qui sont très récents, euh, on a vraiment l'impression d'être en lien direct avec les soldats euh, qui ont, euh, par exemple, porté cet insigne. Euh, le médecin qui euh, a soigné un blessé avec euh, telle seringue, tel bistouri, euh, on peut toucher ce passé euh, du doigt. À Marseille Allier, les Samis étaient en it together avec leurs French et English brethren. Leurs corps vivent through the même fighting received the same wounds, underwent the same amputations, were hit by the same bullets and shells, or blinded by the same gas attacks. Ready to treat the first American casualties were almost a thousand officers, mostly doctors, and 5,000 soldiers, nurses and stretcher bearers working in shifts around the clock. Lucy de Vries is the daughter of one of the Samis who worked at the Mars sur Allier hospital camp. She was born of a true romance, like many others, between an American soldier and a French woman. My father came here after he had been stationed at Bonn at the hospital there. And he came here and he was a medical assistant. And so my father began studying French with Rebecca, my mother. After two weeks, he proposed marriage. But my mother was 16, and she refused. <laughs> he would write a letter every day, and uh, I have all his letters. They're fascinating. They corresponded for three years, and then he came back to marry her, and it was a great love. But back in August 1918, the American Medical Corps personnel had received bad news from the front and were bracing themselves for a massive arrival of casualties. The war was now a war of movement, with tanks clearing the way for troops to come out of the trenches and over the barbed wire. For the Battle of Saint Miel, Pershing mobilized 267 tanks 3,000 artillery pieces and 1,400 airplanes, manned by 216,000 Samis. Technology had joined the fray. This was modern warfare. The American forces met all their objectives in a single day, sustaining only 7,000 losses compared with 17,000 on the German side, and taking more than 13,000 prisoners. After several weeks in action at the front, the Samis were sent to rest camps in the rear. Fun and recreation were the order of the day.
At brayon le noir the Americans took over an underground camp recently seized from the Germans, where they could shelter from the shells raining down on the battlefields. On entering this former stone quarry, the soldiers of the 26th Division and the 101st and 102nd Infantry Regiments found a hundred acres of underground chambers that the Germans had converted into ammunition dumps, dormitories, kitchens or first aid stations. A whole subterranean town where they could rest up. The many things they left behind, some of them intact. Empty bottles, cans of food, cartridge cases, shoes, are reminders of the 25,000 American soldiers who came through here. C'est un espace vraiment exceptionnel parce que on peut fouler le sol que des soldats allemands ou des soldats américains ont foulé ici même il y a une centaine d'années. Et les Américains, ils vivent là essentiellement à la bougie et à la lampe à pétrole. Il y a des cadavres allemands dans la carrière, il y a des soldats allemands qui sont aussi enterrés. Donc l'odeur de poudre enfin, et l'odeur des cadavres, ça ne devait pas être très, très agréable pour ces jeunes Américains. Away from the fury of the battlefields, some soldiers carved words and symbols on the walls. These vestiges are an eloquent record of how they thought and felt. peut-être leur nom, leur unité, la ville d'où ils viennent, mais aussi euh, leur passion. L'ami qui est resté euh, aux États-Unis, c'est euh, pour moi et ma fiancée, enfin ce genre de choses. On sait qu'on va peut-être mourir, ça c'est déjà quelque chose de très important chez ces soldats, et de, de prendre conscience que cette, cette aventure euh, devient rapidement un enfer. Il faut se souvenir qu'il reste encore aujourd'hui sur le champ de bataille les restes de près de 700 000 soldats de toute nationalité qui n'ont jamais été récupérés euh, pendant le conflit. October the 8th, 1918. By now, the Samis were seasoned fighters and fully involved in the big Allied offensives. The last big push was through the Argonne Forest. French and American soldiers fought side by side in absolute mayhem. For the German soldiers, whose last big battle it was, although they didn't know it, and for the Allied troops who gained a dominance that turned out to be decisive, the battle became known as the Hell of the Argonne. It was here that Corporal Alvin York went down in legend for single-handedly killing 28 German soldiers and taking 132 prisoners. But the Samis, many feats of arms, could not disguise their very heavy losses. As one soldier wrote to his mother, The price we paid, I'm not permitted to write about. 
Men who've been in the war since it started say it was the bloodiest 36 hours they ever spent. I'll not write you more about the battle because my heart is too heavy. Behind the lines, Cyrus Leroy Baldridge came across corpses and floods of civilians fleeing the fighting after their homes were destroyed. All I see is a nightmare of horror, a red vision of machine guns and dead men, inspiring only a feeling of disgust for the cold efficiency with which it was accomplished. For nearly a century now, farmers in the Argonne have been unearthing reminders of those bloody days. At Romagne sous Montfaucon, Jean-Paul de Vries has collected more than 40,000 relics within a five kilometer radius of his village cafe come museum. Perhaps the most poignant ones are these small strips of metal with just a name and a service number on them. Ces petits bracelets, ce sont des strips qu'on utilisait pour le, le cimetière temporaire. Hein, en 18, partout les soldats américains qui sont tombés, et on va faire ce, surtout sur le carrefour des cimetières. Et euh, tu as 20 soldats, 30 soldats, 40 soldats, et on met des croix ou on met seulement le, le fusil dans le sol. Et sur le cross du fusil, on met ce strip pour bien identifier le soldat qui était là. J'ai trouvé euh, presque 2000, je crois. Là, c'est une découverte assez émouvante parce que chaque nom, c'était un soldat. Euh, on a même essayé déjà de retrouver la famille. On a retrouvé trois euh, familles. Tous ces soldats, ils avaient un nom et ils étaient perdus. C'est ouais, émouvant. Late October 1918, by now there were two million Samis in France. The tables had turned and the Allies were winning the war. On November 1st, the US Army managed to break through the Germans' last line of defenses, the Freier Stellung. Liberation could begin and fresh hope for a nation. The Samis were given a hero's welcome by villagers who had been prisoners of the Germans for the past four years. As one Sami, Lieutenant Kenneth Gao, described it, I wish you could see the French civilians pop, whom we were liberating as we advance. Their gratefulness, their joy at being in friendly hands once again, and their pitiable condition brought a lump in my throat and a mist over my eyes. Everything they own gone. Their young women violated, some of their families killed, many of them wounded, all of them dazed and numb from the terrific bombardment to which they've been subjected. Amid the rejoicing, the local people showed their gratitude, and the signs of German occupation slowly disappeared. A few days later, on the front line, a bugle call signaled the suspension of hostilities. Germany had surrendered. The war was over. It was 11 a.m. on November the 11th, 1918.
Cyrus Baldridge wrote his last report from the Sami's perspective. We stood up and we didn't say a word. We saw the trenches on the other side, and Jerry too, not making any fuss. Nobody shot, and no one tried to hide. If you'd listened then, I guess you'd heard a sort of sigh from everybody there. In just over seven months, 53,000 Samis had been killed in action. 204,000 had been wounded, and 4,500 were missing. In a stirring message to his army, on November the 12th, 1918, General Pershing personally thanked his men. You have seen many of your comrades make the supreme sacrifice that freedom may live. Your deeds will live forever on the most glorious pages of American history. In August 1919, nearly one year after the last battles, the Samis shipped home. They were greeted as heroes in towns all over America as the nation celebrated its army like never before. The African-American battalions were included in the party and paraded in triumph through Harlem. President Wilson embarked on a tour of European capitals and was cheered wherever he went. He dreamed of a lasting peace in Europe, and to prevent future wars, he had the idea of forming a League of Nations, the ancestor of the UN, that would be ruled by international law and responsible for upholding the independence and territorial integrity of all nation states. But his allies had other ideas. At the peace conference in Versailles, Wilson's ideals collided with the vengeful attitude of the allies, who wanted Germany to accept full responsibility for the war and bear the whole cost of it itself. Wilson deplored the Allies' selfish stand and warned that by crippling Germany for decades to come, they risked plunging the world into another war. But sadly, the American president's warnings went unheeded. Only his idea for a League of Nations was adopted by the victorious country's leaders without debate. President Wilson returned to the United States in triumph, but politically, it had been a defeat. America didn't share Europe's vision of the world. Congress refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles and threw out the proposal for a League of Nations. Wilson's long-held dream was broken. The victory, which he hoped would be good and fair, now smacked of bitterness. October 1921, an unknown soldier chosen from among four unidentified bodies from four big American war cemeteries in France was brought home. This unknown soldier embodied in himself all the Samis who had died in the war whose bodies could not be identified or had disappeared on the battlefields.
Little did these fallen soldiers know that by the end of the war, the United States would be Europe's creditor and the leading world power of the 20th century. Neither could they have known that a century later, the relics of their action in the field would revive the memory of their sacrifice that helped the Allies win the First World War.